So I think I should begin and say to our audience, good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Gateways Music Festival's 2020 Virtual Chamber Music Festival. I'm Tony Marie Montgomery, Dean of the Beenan School of Music at Northwestern University. And I'm also a proud member of the Gateways Board of Directors. Gateways is the unique vision of award-winning concert pianist, Lisa Mings Dumasani, who founded in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 1993. The mission of the festival is to connect and support professional classical musicians of African descent and to enlighten and inspire communities through the power of performance. The Gateways Festival has grown significantly over the years with an in-person six-day festival, attracting more than 125 musicians and drawing combined audiences of more than 7,000. This year, while we are disappointed that we are unable to perform live in Rochester, we are very excited that this virtual format will allow listeners from around the country and from around the world to join us in the celebration of professional classical musicians of African descent. This year's virtual festival, which began yesterday, November 9th, and concludes on Friday the 13th, features 10 public events, a residency with public school students, a five-day daily Gateways radio program, and much, much more. To learn about all this week's activities, we invite you to visit the festival's website at gatewaysfestival.org. You can also become a Gateway supporter by making a donation on our website and clicking Donate. Before introducing our guest speaker for this afternoon's program, we'd like to thank all of our individual and institutional supporters with special recognition to the Eastman School of Music, the University of Rochester, National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. And we extend our sincere appreciation to WXXI, Rochester's public television and radio station for its media sponsorship. This afternoon, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Dwandalyn Reese, Associate Director of the Office for Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. The museum located in DC was established in 2003 and opened its now iconic and permanent home in 2016. Dr. Reese previously served as curator of music and performing arts at the museum for 11 years. And since March of this year, she has served in her current position. In her role as curator of music and performing arts, Dr. Reese was responsible for the acquisition, research, and interpretation of the museum's music and performing arts collection, specifically the permanent exhibition musical crossroads. Dr. Reese earned a bachelor's degree from Scripps College in American Studies and Vocal Music, a master's degree from the University of Michigan in American Culture, and a PhD in Performance Studies from NYU. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dwandalyn Reese to the Gateways Music Festival. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Dawn, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me? We can't hear you, so maybe your mic is covered. From the beginning, actually. Yes. 
So I'm sorry, we didn't hear you from the beginning. And I so said sorry. Some wise words. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Montgomery, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so happy to be with you all, even in the virtual space, to talk about music, something that we all love and appreciate. I, um, I have been at the museum for 11 years, but I have been doing this work using objects to tell stories for close to 30 years. It's hard to think about it. But um, my interest in, in working with music in this way really came from an interest in, um, I mean, in some ways it's a social justice cause. It's understanding people who haven't been appreciated. It's communicating, opening doors of communication and a way to learn about each other and ourselves. And I've always thought, what better way than music, which is something universal and has allowed us to break barriers, to understand different cultures, to express ourselves and deal with um, everything that we deal in our daily lives. So that's been my mission in doing this work. And when I was offered this position 11 years ago, I felt like my, my life had come full circle with the opportunity to be a part of this important institution, but in part as a way to tell the story of African-American music in a way that general audiences may not have understood. And part of that purpose is not just talking about the great artists and contribution, but also the meaning of music in African-American life. And so when I, my first week in the job, um, I realized the magnanimity of what I was charged to do. And it was a little overwhelming at first, but through uh, years of work um, in variety fields and music and culture, um, nonprofit organizations and muse museums, I really felt like I had an opportunity to frame the narrative um, in a different way so that our audiences, and the Smithsonian has an international audience, and it shouldn't go without saying that it's a tremendous uh, responsibility in framing the work you do so that you're opening doors for the millions of visitors who come in. So I, I, I want to talk about a little bit about building the collection, the philosophy behind building it, its importance of being in a national museum, and the importance of telling stories from a variety of perspectives in a way to um, change the larger narratives that we might have learned in, in school or that we learned through the commercial music industry to ones that really understand the meaning behind music and the contributions that we all make to a musical culture. And I look at music not just as performing or composing, but it's its own ecosystem, so to speak, um, in creating that. So we're gonna start first, and I have lots of slides, but I'm gonna keep track of the time. And if we can go to the next slide. Here, we'll start here. Um, we can go back one just for a minute. And this is Musical Crossroads. It is the permanent music exhibition that is that rests in the National Museum of African American Culture. It's on the fourth floor with all the cultural galleries. And what it is is a snapshot of what, as I said, the meaning of African American music and the accomplishments and contributions that African Americans have made to the musical landscape and how it has really shaped um, its own voice and America's voice um, if, through music that really impacts the entire world. So we started out, and we'll go to the next slide now, just to outline how I'm going to approach this, is that um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about my thinking when I started the job and why it was important to have a permanent exhibit on music in the museum and why I feel and many others feel that music and performing arts and I cover music, theater and dance and, and other forms is important to the African-American experience. Um, I think it goes without saying and it may seem tried and true that music is a universal experience. And it is. I mean, every culture has music and uses it as a way to engage personally, to, to celebrate your heritage, a way of life, to worship. 
to entertain, to build communities, to make political and social statements. That way functions, functions everywhere. And the way that it functions for African-Americans who have this unique experience um, bring, being brought to this country as enslaved individuals, it really, um, in many ways, helped us make a way out of no way. And so when you think about music and the power it holds in sustaining people um, in moments of sorrow and joy in forging political movements such as the civil rights movement or Black Lives Matter, um, creating just musical sounds, new genres, and how that has been incorporated into American music, you really see how central it is to the survival. And that is a lot what the African-American uh, experience is, is survival and resilience in a climate that um, was, was framed, and we're talking about it in our current dialogues with systemic racism and oppression. So that is central to African-American identity and to the experience. And every breakthrough, every innovation is, is a way of, of marking that um, and cementing the meaning in African-American lives and the American landscape overall. So I always kept that um, in mind that a music ex exhibition was really important. And what was helpful in our museum is that it's buttressed by 11 other exhibitions that provide the social and historical context. So we have our history galleries on the lower level that go through um, the times of slavery and freedom to the era of segregation to the more modern age, which, which started some 50 years ago. Um, and also stories about community, the military, and other cultural products such as visual arts, film and television, and the like. So music is part of that system. It, 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 it kind of responds to that and is a part of that in a very way. So when I thought about knowing that I had to do this exhibition, the first thing was to acquire the objects and build a collection. When I had arrived, I, I, there was no one who was engaged in music at the museum. There was a small, we were building the collection and some earlier curators did acquire some um, James Brown objects from a, a state auction, but that was basically what we had. So I had to come up with the scheme to kind of organize my collecting, not only to do the exhibit, but what it meant to build a national collection. And in my thinking, um, and from my own personal experiences as a vocalist and, and uh, a scholar in music, is that our collection to be national really had to represent the breadth of African American music making. Um, I, it's easy to think about African American music and just think about the specific genres that, you know, the everyday person in the street would recall gospel, rhythm and blues, soul, hip hop. Um, all of those things that people would associate with African-American music. But African-American music makers, which is a term I really like to use and call upon, were in all kinds of areas. And you, we are learning um, you know, how those roots uh, go deep in classical music, in folk music, um, in, in country music. So my, my goal was to represent that breadth because that really tells the national story of the African-American experience. The other thing that was really important to me was not to just limit myself to telling stories about great performances or great artists, that so much about the story of music is the context in which it is created, um, um, disseminated and explored and received. So those stories go beyond a wonderful object or you know the regions that music is created in, the social cultural stru structures that music creates. We talk about venues that performed, colleges and conservatories that nurtured musical um, education and professionalism, schools in the community, even your music teacher that you had when you were in grade school. All of these things par really play a role in creating a music system and culture that has nurtured musical production and creation. 
So with that in mind, I'd like to run you through a couple of uh, slides about exhibition, but the types of things we started to collect in building the exhibition and developing the, the exhibit. So if we can go to the next slide. So it's important when we look at 400 plus years of, of music making, we're talking about a variety of objects. We want to get the earliest things that represent the, the instruments that the enslaved created, the, the music they performed, um, all of those things in an earlier area, which is um, also a challenge. And as we know, if we look at African-American museums and their importance, African-American culture and history was not something that was well collected long ago. Um, part of that, that story and building this museums and other museums is trying to find the material culture that helps tell those stories. Um, so in many ways, we're playing catch up. But when we can, we want to talk about the roots of African-American music, its connections to Africa, to, to the different cultures that resided there, and its, its um, translation you know, through, through the Caribbean and, and to, the, um, to the continent. So when we can, we try to establish those roots. And here you have a, a wooden drum, um, not the earliest century, but it's a 19th century, but reminiscent of not, some, not only of the earlier instruments, but some of the elements that are important in telling the style of music, like rhythm, the role of the drum in enslaved communities and tool of communication, and how the beat and rhythm is a hallmark of African traditions that have gone to live on through music, um, through all kinds of genres into the 21st century. Next slide. Of course, the, the, another earlier incarnation is the role that sacred music has taken in African American communities from the spirituals to, to gospel today and other incarnations. This was a um, the colored sacred harp, um, the shape note singing that we were able to acquire a book um, really important in, in telling the story of religion and sacred music is, um, you know, that could be a music, uh, a, a museum in and of itself. So that you look at um, hymns and oratorials and arranged spirituals, then you get into gospel and different formats. We talk about sacred steel. We have a sacred steel guitar and then the evolution of gospel over the late 19th and 20th century. So we have, this is the type of objects that we collect. I think anything is fair game as long as it helps us really tell a good story. Um, things that I don't have photographs of that you'll find in the exhibit. We have Thomas Dorsey's rehearsal piano that existed for the many, many decades that he was music director at Pilgrim Baptist Church. And so through that piano, we don't even we don't only tell stories about Thomas Dorsey, his roots in the blues, his, you know, the 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 way that he really pioneered you know, the modern gospel sound, but all the location and the roots of gospel in Chicago. And so any of these objects, we look at them not only as material culture that should be cherished, but ways that help us tell stories that help our visitors learn more about music. Next slide. Again, we, we, we tell about uh, stories uh, from the 20th, 21st century. Um, here we have a costume, an early costume, early 1970s of the Jackson Five. Um, uh, telling stories about music is also about attire. It's about performance. And those of you who are old enough, like me, you remember the 70s and the way out fashions. And so music production, particularly when you get into the entertainment in industry, your, your performers, you're selling a product. And the fashions of the day are just as much part of the story, how music plays out in society. Next slide. And then, of course, we have the stories we do know about jazz. We, we have the Duke Ellingtons, we have the Count Basies and the Ella Fitzgeralds, but there are other um, figures that um, were just as active in the jazz scene. This is a bandstand for Panama Francis of a band he led, um, the Savoy Sultans. 
And so you think about the types of objects, not just manuscripts or drums or batons, but a bandstand. Um, there are unique things out there that help us tell stories in very different ways. Next slide. And then we move into hip hop and the variety of things. Um, you know, hip hop in many ways is, is very similar like jazz was at its moment. It was coming out of a scene that really was African-American experience and created something new that went global. The types of things that we can do. This is just a, a, um, um, a sheet, track sheet from um, Ladies First. Um, with Queen Latifah and Moni Love and other artists. A very simple thing that is, uh, you know, something that you might think that you can throw away, but becomes a prized object in helping to tell the story of hip hop and some of the pioneers. Also a story where hip hop is very male centered, the role that women play in hip hop is also, you know, frequently overlooked. And so we get to illuminate that, but also give visitors a chance to get another way in about how music is created um, from a music industry perspective and an inside look about that creativity and the production um, I'm telling that story. Next slide. And here you'll see some of those objects uh, from a slide in the exhibition. The layout is really open. And even though they're all quibbles about genres and the borders and barriers that they create and how people have uh, broken them down in their own musical performance and creation, we use it as a guide because that's what visitors are most familiar with. But you also see in the layout, it's also very open, giving a sense of how one genre can feed into the other. And so right here, you see jazz next to classical, next to sacred. And in that sense, you get a sense of the stories of those particular genres. But we have audio visual also playing the musical examples that bleed one off the other. And so many of you who are music aficionados, performers and the like, in creating and playing your own music, I'm sure you get what that means and that we are informed by the music we listen to and are exposed to. Next slide. So we move on with our collecting and some of our objects that are great stories, the, the story of Blind Tom or Thomas Green Wiggins, an enslaved man um, that was sold to uh, another family who profited off of his musical genius. Um, he was a great mimic, but he could also play and, and compose a variety of things. And so you have this story, not only of a stellar musician, but a musician who also uh, represents that story of enslaved people and the sense of autonomy, autonomy and liberty and how people make production out of the labor of African-Americans and how this genius was presented in that way, but still able to create music and, and to pave the way. But it's interesting at the end of his story, um, you have this flute that was made for him. Um, and it, it, it was one of the prized things left in his collection upon his death. So throughout all the music making and performing, at the end of the day, uh, Thomas Green Wiggins did not remain the benefactor of that wealth that created um, the enjoyment that people had of his music, but ended up with this one flute as his prized possession. So you, you get a sense, I hope, about the stories that you can tell and how they frame um, the narratives from a historical, social, and cultural context. And this is one thing that we do have on the exhibit floor right now. Next slide. And of course, the strong roots in classical music, which is so much of what your group is focused on. It's important for visitors to think who still today, if you look at current dialogues and the roles of African-Americans in classical music, and there's still barriers to break, but the roots of African-Americans in classical music run deep. Frank Johnson is, is one of the first figures to, to rise to prominence. And so we have music of, of um, 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 that printed music in, his, in our collection. And also in telling his story, we talk about 
um, African Americans in, in classical music, but we also get to talk. Frank Johnson was from Philadelphia, and when I I'll get into this more, where certain regions built their own musical scenes. Phil Philadelphia is a good example. New Orleans is another example. Detroit and many others, how they were, you know, a hotbed for musical creation for a variety of genres, and region plays a very big part in this story and musical sounds and in support and venues in telling this story. Next slide. Um, of course, uh, again, we talk about classical spiritual music. This is just one um, item in the Hall Johnson collection, a very rich collection that not only tells the story of Hall Johnson and his work with the spiritual, uh, spirituals and in film, um, it is. It contains business records, correspondence, but it also, if, when you go through the collection, it's um, not only his personal collection, but it, it's a story of so many artists who were really paving the way uh, during this time in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and numerous writings about the role of African-American music and the spirituals, um, scores and manuscripts, programs about artists, um, some many of us have never heard of, but how these artists are really in a system where they're listening to each other and providing opportunities for each other to play. I um, Interesting, the last time I was in our storage location, we had just required a uh, collection of Shirley Verrett materials. And in the Hall Johnson collection, there was a, a letter and a note that he had written to someone about Shirley Verrett who was just getting started, um, fresh uh, graduate out of Juilliard. And Paul Johnson writes this note saying, this is someone to watch. And you, so you see those collections and the connections to musical theater of the day, to artists, uh, composers like Dean Dixon. There's something about everybody just in this collection. So it's richness for, for research and reference is, is phenomenal. And I'm happy to share these stories of, as, of Paul Johnson as an instrumentalist before he becomes the composer and musical director that we are all, um, you know, well known to see him as. Next slide. Of course, in classical music, we were able to collect um, objects from Meta Wilda Dobbs uh, before she passed away early on. And, and then another story about uh, women in, in classical music, um, vocalist, also the global um, nature of the achievements that many women were able to make in classical music, um, despite the difficulties they might have had in performing in the United States, there was a reception globally um, of African American performers in classical music that really shows the global reach of African American music makers and the significance and impact that um, they had. Um, Marian Anderson is another one, and we'll get to a slide about her in a few minutes. Next slide. So when I talk about the breadth of African American music, Charlie Pride is a wonderful example. Um, our first biggest superstar, um, even though DeFord Bailey, if some of you know the history of country music, was on the Grand Ole Opry uh, a couple cent, uh, a couple decades earlier. So the roots of African Americans in country music is long and deep. And it's not necessarily on the periphery, but when you talk to people and there's a lot of articles and things out there about African American music and African American musicians and country music, right now that country music is also part of an African-American heritage. And we, we had the benefit to have a generous donation from Charlie Pride with objects that really tell, tell not only helped, helped tell his story and the pioneering road he had, but the connections that are made between African-American music and country music. Next slide. All of these things could tell a variety of stories and we're gonna kind of whip through uh, some of these just to give you a taste of what we have, but then spend a little more time on some of them to show the connections and, and how we find different avenues to tell these stories, not only in our exhibitions and through um, 
blogs that we might put on on the website, but through uh, our programming, through other things, a partnership with Smithsonian Folkways Recordings, we're doing a hip hop anthology and other ways of getting these stories out to the general public. So another thing that we like to talk about is the history of rock and roll music. Um, the public narrative really talks about rock and roll music and, and how it represents um, the rebellion of, of, of white America and how that narrative has in frequent times got dissociated from its African-American roots. When you talk about Chuck Berry or Little Richard or Bo Diddley or Louis Jordan and, and the, the, the roots of Afri uh, rock and roll um, from the jump blues on and how at some point it becomes this, this uh, story about post-World War II America. And then you have the Beatles and the Rolling Stones breaking on scene and, and metal rock that you get to a point um, in the 80s and 90s that um, the Black music musicians who are playing rock and roll by, by music labels are kind of looked at as interlopers, that they have no place in the story that they help create. Um, Jimi Hendrix um, was one of those figures, kind of transitional figures, even in the short time he was alive, that he really put a public face um, on connecting African Americans to rock and roll, and and one of those figures that that transcended um, those barriers in a way. Um, so we were very lucky to get this is a slant speaker that he used on stage, and if you notice, there's a little rip. And that was something Jimi Hendrix traditionally did with speakers to amplify his sound. So we use a variety of objects, not just instruments, not just clothing, but equipment to tell the stories of, of artists, how they make music, um, how they perform music, but really shape who they are and their influence on the musical landscape. Next slide. And again, I mentioned a Shirley Barrett collection that we just acquired, another rich collection that um, is in processing right now. We will have some of those objects on exhibit in um, summer of 2021, but we have costumes, we have music, we have photographs, but we also have interesting things like her notebook from Juilliard. So we have the notes that she took. So we look about the student and the training um, and the hard work that many of these artists um, undertook to get to where they are. So I just wanted to tell again about the variety of things that help us tell these stories. Next slide. So it's not only the, the, the non-obvious things that we use, and I wanted to bring these two items um, as example. They're, they're the two largest iconic objects <laughs> in the collection and on the exhibit floor on my, well, on the left side, I hope for you, is the famous mothership, Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, George Clinton donated this to the museum in, in 2012. It's not the original. There's a mythic origin story about what happened to the original mothership. And as rumor has it, it was taken apart for pieces and buried somewhere in a field in, in Maryland. But George Clinton did manufacture a replica that actually sit in the, sat in, the home, in his home in Tallahassee. And when we approached him about um, donating it, he was, um, you know, very to the idea so that in 2012, the mothership landed in, in Washington, D.C. And what's interesting about story, I mean, it tells a story particularly about performs, the shows and the spectacle um, of how this was used on stage. But it's also interesting to think about the, the um, outcry of support when it was announced that we had acquired this. Many people, um, um, many people in Washington, D.C. took great pride in it because you know, at some point in time, Washington, D.C., um, regain uh, the moniker's Chocolate City, but people were also astounded that something like this would be in the Smithsonian. And to me, that really pointed us that, that it was important to explore music from the pop popular to the secular to the sacred, 
that people did not see themselves as as uh, or see these objects as things that uh, that they would find in a typical Smithsonian exhibit. And one thing about our museum is that we the way we tell stories is that we really embrace stories from all points of view. It's not just the elite. It's not just the famous names. It's the things that mean to pe things to people in popular music that speak to who people are and where they are. So it was it was um, gratifying to see in this acquisition that um, people felt that way, and we were proud to be able to include it in the exhibition. The other thing that we acquired, our big signature object, is Chuck Berry's Cadillac, um, a signature object that greets you in the opening ex exhibition. Um, he donated his one of his Maybelline guitars and this Cadillac that he was also associated with. And while it's easy to just look at this Cadillac and see it as this, you know, shiny red object that belonged to Chuck Berry, there's other meanings behind what this Cadillac signifies in the exhibit and in our collections. This Cadillac, those of you who are familiar with the 1984 documentary, Hail, Hail Rock and Roll, which really explores the history and story of, of Chuck Berry and his influence on rock and roll. And this is a Cadillac, if some of you remember that documentary, that he drove across the stage in the Fox Theater in, in the film. And the Fox Theater, the irony of it, it was the same theater that turned him away as a child. So think about it. You have this, this figure who's uh, an architect, uh, you know, a great American icon in American music, um, signifying his, his liberation and freedom and influence in breaking through those barriers, um, driving this very car on the stage that, um, ostracized him at one point in time. So it's an American story, but it's also an African-American story of, of progress. And I always liken the two that there are also themes um, that you can think about of, of liberation and movement and how vehicles and the mothership could talk about those, those messages of liberation that, um, that are well uh, covered in African-American music of traveling. Um, you think of the spirituals and movement that both of these objects kind of speak about that, that, that journey, um, the mothership, particularly the journey and Afrofuturism and, and people like Sun Ra envisioning a different um, uh, landscape or, or, or spacescape of envisioning a different African-American identity. So part of my purpose is to think about how these objects get to themes that we can think about music in new ways. Next slide. Uh, another recent acquisition about interesting objects and iconic objects, we were lucky to acquire a couple years ago, um, Charlie Parker's King Alto Sax. It's only one of two existing saxophones um, that exist. The other one's in the uh, Jazz Museum in Kansas City. Uh, this was made for um, Parker in 1947. It's really associated with his sound at that time, uh, in the later years of his life. And highly probable, of course probable, that this, this appears on many recordings and, and, and uh, many, many appearances Char uh, Charlie Parker made. Um, there's so many things about the design. We were able to do a 3D scan so you can really get a close look that I, I couldn't bring here, but you can collect, get a close look of the design features of, of the saxophone and, and certain elements that helped uh, Parker produce the sound that he's associated with, uh, with today with his wide bell and to talk about his influences from his, his um, harmonic improvisations to the sound he created and to his influences on bebop. So this is another object that you can explore from not only Parker's genius, but the role of Kansas City in music um, from technical virtuosity. Next slide. Another story we talk about 
um, iconic artist, but also the place of region. Here are shoes from Fats Domino, uh, son of New Orleans, an architect, an architect of, of rhythm and blues and rock and roll. The interesting story about these shoes that they were rescued from his home um, after Hurricane Katrina. So you get those ties of, of the, the meaning of place and New Orleans, it, it carries its own ambiance of all and so many musical forms. And so you, you tie Fats Domino to place, to his, his own contributions as a musician, but also the role that New Orleans has played in muni musical genres, including jazz um, and rhythm and blues. So it's an opportunity to get at that story as well. Next slide. Of course, in telling stories about music, um, there's it's not only about musicians, but it's also about the places where music is performed, uh, venues, musical theater. This is a costume from The Wiz, uh, costumes designed by uh, Jeffrey Holder of the, the 1975 musical that uh, was a great time for African-American musicals in the 70s to tell uh, a, a fabled story from an African-American perspective, from the music to the storyline, to the costumes and to the artists. And so we're lucky to have many of these costumes that are in the uh, Black Fashion Museum collection to help to talk about even Holder's um, conception of how these these instruments reflect African diasporic um, traditions in a way. So musical stage and musical theater was another way for getting African-American music out to larger audiences. Next slide. Uh, costuming and fashion. This is a costume of Bootsy Collins who played with Parliament and other artists, a great artist um, uh, who is, is known for his outfits. We have this on exhibit with his guitar and starred glasses. And so that fashion becomes a popular way that many artists conceptualize themselves and their own person personas as they perform. Next slide. Another costume from Nona Hendrix. Um, the different incarna incarnation of, of, of LaBelle, which started off as, as one of the many girl groups, um, you know, singing the songs of the 60s. But in the 70s, they really created a new persona, um, burgeoning disco Afrofuturism, but also kind of liberating tendencies, um, telling musical stories from a woman's perspective. And so we get to talk about the role of women in music um, but also the fashion and the own interventions of telling things from a woman's perspective. Next slide. And again, you know, when you move throughout the, the decades, uh, the objects change, the classic boombox. And here's one from Public Enemy that they used on tour for many years. And then we have artists, we move into hip hop. We also move into artists um, telling stories that have uh, social, cultural, and political relevance. Um, so much about Public Enemy is is about social consciousness, and and this this item not only part of their their whole story, but um, uh, an instrument that is used um, by a different generation, but a way another way that music reaches people and and becomes a tool for getting the music, getting the music heard, so to speak. Next slide. Um, this is another object that we talk about. It's it's so easy to get into the traps of talking about performers and people on stage. Um, there are other stories such as music conductors, as this photograph of Dean De Dixon, composers, when you get into the industry, producers, um, publicists. What are the things that we don't popularly think about? We think of music educators, we think of churches, music in the church. And so much of those stories are part of that experience. So in part of the collecting that we do, it's really important to me that we look for those stories that 
um, as many, we, we tell the stories um, of the seen and unseen and kind of not only raise the profile, but raise the significance of how music in a variety of forms and it's created tells the story of the African-American experience. Next slide. Composers, Nathaniel Dett, this is just another sample of the things that we can collect. Next slide. Um, so much of the industry uh, about music, particularly when you get in the commercial sector, um, getting the music heard and achieving success. As you all know, there were many barriers in the music industry uh, when you got into radio and recording and which resulted in um, record labels uh, from regional record labels to the big ones that we know like Motown and, and Stax and Philadelphia International, but also to the achievements that African-Americans have made in the music industry. And part of that is the power in, in selling records. It's in the promotion of your product. It's having creative control, having people in the executive suites making decisions. These have all opened doors for African-American musicians in a variety of wet ways. So it's always so important to tell those stories of how promotion, publicity, and awards um, help op help open avenues and point to the successes of how African-American music not only goes, uh, thrives throughout the United States, um, but in um, a global atmosphere. Another recent acquisition is that we talk about these things, the role, this is a Diamond Award, award that Usher received, um, and I can't remember the number of sales, but it's a high number of sales that are awarded to artists that have um, reached that number. So you get a sense that uh, you know, we do know that awards on everything, but in an industry that is based on selling a commercial product, it shows what power and recognition it gives to African American artists who have who are operating in these spheres. Next slide. Posters, pub publicity. This is of Calvin Slims, a, a con um, conductor that we have in our our music industry section. Next slide. Um, another thing that we're very interested in is the diaspora, um, that their music does not operate and is only influenced by what's happening in the United States, but our connections to the Caribbean, um, Latinx communities, to Africa, to uh, African communities throughout the globe. So we're very committed to telling those stories as well. Um, this is a costume worn by Sergio Cruz. And so we talk about the African diaspora and, and the Latin experience is it from an African um, diasporic perspective. Next slide. Um, Augustus Adams, another story, uh, first naval officer, black naval officer uh, during World War I, um, came up to us as the Virgin Islands, uh, but a lifelong Navy man who conducted um, the band, and we have a couple of things, his flute, that was his instrument, and also his service record, which you can't see up close, but it shows his excellent service as bandmaster for many years. And so you talk about the role of the military, you talk about um, people in the Caribbean and excellence and, and how he was engaged and how the military um, the one ways it did provide opportunities even throughout segregation um, was through music. Next slide. Um, music is so intricately tied to dance that we do look at those connections of performance. And so the Dance Theater of Harlem, these are ballet shoes that are in um, one of our other exhibits, but also the music, um, classical music that feeds off of to that. Next slide or the costumes. This is from Lauren Anderson, um, the first principal ballet with the, the Houston Ballet Company. Next slide. Um, broadsides, um, which is also the story of performers, um, um, particularly maybe classically oriented performers, but you know, the spheres they traveled in and many of them 
They were looked down upon for classical music and may not have had those many opportunities, but they did perform in other forms. And this is a, a lovely large broadside that we have in the collection. And this is Maddie Wilkes. Next slide. Um, then I'm going to talk about, even though I am telling stories with objects, I want to go into a couple more just to show those examples. I did want to point out this room in our exhibit. This is the neighborhood record store. And it was very important to me when you're doing an exhibit about music, music is a very live thing that you have to hear it, you have to play it, you have to experience it. So in one in sense, when you do it in an exhibit, um, you're kind of separating it from its, its origins. But I also thought it was very important, the one thing about music is the sense of community. Um, whether you're an audience or whether you're performing together or whether you're just with people enjoying music. And that's one of the greatest things that our old fashioned record stores really offered us. And so in this space, I wanted to bring bridge the old with the new, um, kind of giving us a sample of what the record stores, you know, replicas and albums and people thumbing through, but also um, an opportunity to use digital technology, which gives us an opportunity to learn so much more about the music. And so we have um, several genres and make connections and have a timeline and uh, you know, a collective playlist that people can select excerpts and it just plays in the whole space and, and um, people um, experience together. And it's really turned out to be a great intergenerational space of um, you know, young people telling stories about current music and other people talking about things that they listen to in the past and different genres that we listen to. Next slide. Um, here's a violin that was acquired from its story that it traveled through generations from an enslaved family. So while it's just a simple violin in one story, it talks to us about the role of music um, and building a sense of community, um, but also the nature of the heirlooms that travel throughout a family from the period of enslavement to freedom. Next slide. Um, the banjo, the quintessential instrument and part of a movement where we're trying to reclaim the black history of the banjo. Um, that's a feature item in this exhibit, but also a recent acquisition that um, actually had a provenance. This is a gentleman, George Stinson, who played um, a late 19th century in minstrel shows and won many awards and competitions at a banjo. Um, and after traveling, he settled in Ohio and created his own school and had this partnership with the Stinson Banjo Company, which they would make banjos and stamp them with his name and send the pieces to him to train students and build the banjo. So he created his own school. So you see this commerce and connection and really the rare opportunity to have a banjo that has a provenance or association with an African-American musician. So it's great to have objects like this that can make clear connections to um, important stories. Next slide. Marian Anderson, uh, remnants of the great outfit she wore at the 1939 Lincoln Memorial Concert. Um, it's an opportunity to tell that important story, but also to look at Marian Anderson, the artist. I mean, so much we talk about her social significance, but what about her artistic excellence as an artist who really worked hard at her craft and, and you know, was well received globally um, and paved the way for many, many artists today. And we also have her diary, one of her diaries. So give, you get a little insight glimpse of um, a very private person, but just the day to things she talked about and also stories about her own engagement with music and um, how she uh, thought about her own performances and the like. Next slide. And we talk about the continuity. This is a dress that Marian Anderson gave to Denise Graves um, that Denise Graves uh, donated to us. And, and you know, there are countless singers uh, who reach out to Marian Anderson and, and looked for her for advice um, and 
Denise Graves was just one of the many, and she, Ms. Anderson was well known for giving dress to some of these artists who followed in her stead. And so this count, continuity in generations, um, the influence and inspiration that great artists like these uh, take um, to make their own achievements in, in a given field. Next slide. Nina Simone, um, classical and popular social protest. If you know the story of Eunice, um, Nina Simone, she started off wanting to be a classical artist. And you see she was doing recitals very early on in her career. Uh, you, this is a recital card under her birth name, Eunice Wayman, uh, performing in Philadelphia, um, sponsored by the Philia branch of the uh, National Association of Negro Musicians. And what I like about this, it, it shows not only her early ambitions, but it ties of how some organizations like the National Association of Negro Musicians were provided forums for artists to perform music. So we really are working in structures in which there is mutual support and collaboration of the organizations, churches that provide venues for this music to be heard. And I think those are important things to recognize and understand. Next slide. Another unknown story, this is Ginger Smock. Um, a violinist who was really uh, part of the Central Avenue scene in the 40s and 50s. Um, Well-known violinist, but for a variety of reasons, did not get the opportunities um, that would have made her uh, a more famous name. Uh, you know, here's an instance where we're talking about a woman in jazz, not as a vocalist, but as a violinist. And, she had her own group, the Sepia Tones, and we see a photograph here, um, and had her own band and, and really was influential. She, she did a lot of work on television and, and on ships, but it's a story of, of a woman who pioneered the craft, but also a story of women in music and opportunity um, that wasn't available to as many people as we would hope. Next slide. And you know, one of the things we're very interested in these narratives, and as in this being the year of the woman with uh, um, the, the the 2020, the 100 year centennial of the suffragette movement, and and you know, the first vice president, that it's important to it's important to me as a curator to make sure that we elevate these stories just as well. So of course we have a story of the great John Coltrane. Um, but we also have items, and this one is in media form of his wife, who was also uh, a musician in her own right. And so uh, one of the things that we want to do, and that is, is one of my primary goals, is to elevate these stories of women in music, as musicians, as instrumentalists, as composers, as songwriters, as producers, as teachers, that we get a sense that men, women were part of this story, uh, just as the many men who are elevated in the names that we know. So I'd like to take an opportunity to, you can't do a music presentation without a little music or a little thing, just to show you this clip. Uh, this is Alice Coltrane. She was featured in an episode of Black Journal. Um, and in the early 70s, it was about three years after John Coltrane's uh, death. But she talks a little bit about music and just a short clip of her playing. Otherwise, it would have taken all the time. So if we could go to that clip. That, this is the way that I had to go in life because I accept uh, the music from him. You know, I accept... Uh, the things that he that he did and it seems to be exactly what I want to do because there's so many things that he did in music I would have done the same way myself it was always when he played that expression that came out of him was really what was inside you know whatever was real whatever was truth this is what came out of John when he played 
you know, my background was uh, piano. But I've studied organ and theory, harmony. The first practice on harp was done around about 1965. Maybe it's the way, it, because I know uh, the instrument is, is of uh, Egyptian origin, but uh, when I play it, I don't know, maybe the flowingness of it or the, the way it's so uh, harmonically and uh, melodically set, so different from uh, the piano, uh, for example. It makes me recall Egypt, ancient Egypt. It makes me seem to remember that, that, that I have a past or a history there somewhere. Yeah, thank you. I thought we skipped a slide. So moving on, we've got a few more slides to go through. And then um, I'd love to just entertain questions about what I've showed or any anything about what we're doing at the museum um, with music or questions about the objects. Um, musical institutions, Black institutions are critical to the story of, of the African-American experience. Um, from the organizations we've talked about, to schools, to conservatories, and also HBCUs. You can't tell the story of some of the greatest composers and musicians without telling the story of HBCUs. So I think it's, it's very important to capture that. We were um, lucky to acquire a um, collection from William P. Foster. Uh, some of you who may know Florida A&M, king of the marching band unit, the Florida A&M Marching 100. William P. Foster was a um, pioneer um, in, in, in the marching band and, and chair and music director at Florida, Florida A&M for, for many decades. And so we were, were proud to have uh, an opportunity to show the uniform and some of the instrument, instruments um, from that band, but also to tell the story about Foster's significance, the role that the marching band played as uh, um, also for students, or for discipline. And there are many well-known people who've gone through, through the program, but as an outlet for students, as a representation of the school, as an ambassador of the school, um, discipline in music training, and you can't forget the great marching band shows in the formation um, that is really uh, a signature, unique element of the HBCU experience that has really shaped the world. And um, we will be exhibiting some of these items in our exhibition next summer. So I, I wanna mention those particular themes. Let me go to the next slide. So here's a, a nice little pairing. Um, these are Sammy Davis Jr.'s tap shoes as a child um, that we're happy to have in the collection and are currently on exhibit. And of course, we, you know, he is one of the greatest entertainers um, that ever lived. Um, and and you know, he kind of set a model for there are other figures who just can do anything and everything. So it's it's you know you can look at him and his his um, his particular story, but how he shaped the world for a modern entertainer in dance, film, um, as a vocalist. But we also paired this um, with a flyer. Uh, it was a pre-March Freedom Rally um, in which Sammy Davis um, performed, and what we use objects also to tell particular themes. And one of the particular themes in, in the African-American experience is the role of music in solidarity and protest um, from artists performing at events to creating music. Uh, Max Roach, um, the, the, a lot of jazz composers, other compu composers, 
um, Nina Simone by engaging in, in some of the, the really important uh, social movements of our time and then how music has been a venue and a forum for protest from the spirituals to the 30s and 40s with Lead Belly, Odetta, and continues to that day. And so these are some of the important themes that we use objects like these to help us tell and to link how artists are tied to these particular stories. Next slide. And then again, the Chuck Berry um, guitar, just another signature object. And I just threw that in for an opportunity for you to see. Next slide. Moving closer into the present, um, this is a boa that Andre 3000 wore in one of the performances. Um, in not only a story about hip hop, it is also a story about region. When you talk about um, hip hop in the South, the South got something to say and how the message um, from Southern hip hop artists and even when Outkast came as a scene, it was a new direction for hip hop and carving out a place for that identity and message and, and mode of creation. So you saw the fashion and the signature outfits that Andre 3000, but we talk about him as well as talk about those larger stories. Next slide. Um, unknown stories. I, I think an important story is the role that record labels and radio played. This is a story that came to our attention a couple years ago. Bill Hawkins, he was a DJ in Cleveland. And during his heyday in the 40s and 50s, he had his, um, a lot of these things were in black communities. And, and so you get to start about not only the venues but how things tied to music were central spaces in African-American communities. And you can point to any state throughout the nation or city you know, everybody had, and I grew up in Denver, we had Five Points, um, Atlantic City, they had that neighborhood of Club Harlem, but these communal, communities were social spaces um, that supported, he supported a talent show in the local high schools, he had record studios, you had people coming, and I get back to the neighborhood record studio, record store as a uh, as a community space. Um, this is a time when artists would come to the studio. So we would do radio shows. Um, he sold records and also for a while had his own record label. And so we get to tell those stories in places besides uh, New York or Detroit, but this, in, in Cleveland. And so these things were very important in African-American communities in the music scenes there. Next slide. Um, also another story, um, not only from the variety of ways that Curtis Mayfield was a major influence, but also the roots of, of rhythm and blues and gospel in Chicago. And in Curtis Mayfield, we talk about him as a musician, as a, a, a musician with a social consciousness, the success he had with film, with uh, scoring Superfly and his own iconic image in creating Kurtom records um, to his influence, to his signature glasses that he wore. And so we, we use these objects not to just tell the story of an artist, but particular things that they touched and influenced and that they were influenced by. Next slide. Um, media, I mean, that changed the landscape. Uh, from radio to recording to TV shows like Soul Train. And Soul Train, um, not only promoting the music of Black artists, but it was a television show for Black communities um, with a great host, Don Cornelius. He not only promoted musicians, but Black culture. He would bring in politicians. Um, you'd get a little bit of black history with the scramble board, but it was a really focal place for many decades that African-American audiences saw themselves, their music and their concerns represented. And you can't forget the Soul Train dance line. We also have several costumes of the Soul Train dancers, which is part of it. its iconic presence and, and legacy. Next slide. What would we like to collect? Here's a shot from our music industry section. Um, and we talk about more of the industry from publishing 
We have a couple of objects from Philadelphia International Records, including Tom Bell's um, iconic turquoise blue piano where he composed many of his hits and the shag carpet door that was used to insulate sound when they were recording. But we continue to collect. I mean, we, we've furiously collected in order to create the exhibit. And now that we're open, people get a sense of what we're interested in and how we tell stories and how we use objects. So as we think about the future, we can go to the next slide. We think about the things, the holes. I mean, there's so many more things to collect. And, and as a museum, we have a certain amount of space. But to me, I look for things that help us tell multiple stories. So I always say it, it's not always just the shiny objects, but what are the critical, important stories that we want to tell? So I've, I've isolated a few here. I want to tell more about instrumentalists. I want to talk about composers. I want to talk about songwriters, people, conductors, people who are behind the scenes, so to speak. I think it's really important to talk about the links with the diaspora that includes um, the contributions of um, artists um, of Latinx identities, African artists who have influenced by American music and American mu music that's influenced by other cultures. And we really need to talk about those stories and elevate those stories. Also the LGBTQ um, presence and to highlight those contributions and elevate those stories that may have been hidden at some time, but deserve to be told from those artists' ex um, experiences. I've talked a lot, a great deal about women and also the regional influences um, that many of the great artists that we know today, that what they learned at home and in their own community really shaped who we are. And we need to get back to those stories of the music that continues to thrive in these communities. Um, Transatlantic musical influence and community-based stories. Um, music in community is used to deal with youth, um, create a forum um, for uh, um, youth to get engaged, um, to build community festivals, community gatherings, events, um, schools. We've got to talk about the music teachers at nauseum about what role they played in our music education. And also there's more to do about the institutions and organizations. I want to look at some of those historical ones that have shaped music, um, the venues, the theaters, um, the organizations that supported artists um, um, throughout the centuries. And then a new area, what it means to collect um, born digital formats. I mean, we're in a new age and particularly this year, um, the musical landscape has changed and how do we capture that with digital media um, from the ways that people make music together to the, the videos and things they create on screen. Um, that, that's part of our history as well. Um, and we have to think about how do we document this because we're a museum not only about the past and the present but about the future as well. I want to go to our next slide. You know, in, in the exhibit, um, part of what I was able to do is, is not, uh, is drawn from my, my own role as a scholar. And, and this quote from Eileen Southern, I, I think it's important to acknowledge the people who has recorded this history for us and paved a way that um, the story of African-American music uh, has is given its due, and I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, there are a world of performers who are historians themselves, scholars who are really elevating these stories, and they're doing such important work and making more and more available to the public. And you know, we have this quote up in the exhibit, but I think it's an important one to mention because African American music in in the United States is it's artistic, it's heritage, but it's also a way to communicate. And there's never going to be a time when musicians are not going to have anything to say. 
either to others and to God. And so I close my presentation with this last clip. It was a find um, of an acquisition, an episode of, of Studs Place. Studs Terkel had this television show um, in, in Chicago and he would bring in a variety of artists. It was a half hour show. And he was a good friend of Mahalia Jackson and she made an appearance on a Christmas episode. Um, this was an unknown episode. The collection of the studs uh, of the studs television show did not even have this episode, and this was found in someone's basement. It had been sent to Mahalia Jackson, and for some reason, it resigned. It was in this house, and Mahalia Jackson appears in, as herself. It's a Christmas program. A young woman is. Uh, I cannot get in touch with her. Um, a fiance who's in the service, and Mahalia just kind of drops by the the um, restaurant to rest and find a bite to eat. But she also has an opportunity to sing. So let's go into this last clip with Mahalia Jackson on Studs Place. Well, it's getting late. Nancy, I know do you just have to leave now, honey? Well, I kept telling her it's getting late, and they all have some place to go to. Oh, no, oh, oh, no, 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 And you are not in any condition to leave with me here tonight. Let me sing a song that I sing for myself when I'm burdened, and it has helped me so many times. And in your condition tonight, I'm sure it'll help you. Come on, have a seat. Let me sing for you. I feel just coming. Why should the shadow come? Why should my heart? Hello, forever and home. When Jesus is my portion, my car. Oh, I see, I see. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Reese. This is just an excellent presentation. I have four pages of notes that I took, and um, I, it reminds me of my visit. I've unfortunately only been to the museum once, but how much there is that uh, has been collected, how much um, I hope that all of us who are watching and others whom uh, we will tell uh, will look in their basements and other places to think of the collections that we have, which uh, can be memorialized forever. Um, there were uh, lots of comments that were shared uh, from the people watching. And one person just wrote the one word, love, love. Um, another said, just a wonderful talk. One person asked a question, and it's almost, I guess, like choosing between your favorite children. But the question is, of all the artifacts that you have in your collection, uh, is there one that just for you personally means so much? And you could say it would be, I, I'll uh, paraphrase, one of your favorites, maybe not your favorite item. Ooh, that is hard. Um, mm. You know, I, I guess I kind of go by, you know, you know, these objects take a life of their own with me. And I, when I encounter one, I, I am just in awe on the history that is just represented in them, every single one of them. Um, there are two things that, that come to mind and I have a lot of favorite objects. Um, there was a lot of awe and en enjoyment when we were able to acquire the Marian Anderson outfit for one reason. I mean, for worse reason, I didn't think anything existed. You know, Penn, University of Pennsylvania has her entire collection. And so it's an interesting story. We acquired that through research we did on the dress that Denise Graves had given. Um, the story is Denise Graves had that dress and she wanted to wear it for a 75th an um, anniversary celebration of that concert. And she sent it to the cleaners and they ruined it. And, you know, she was just, you know, panicked. And she uh, sent it to a seamstress at the Duke Ellington School who did her magic. And, you know, part of the thing when we acquire things, we, we do research, you know, not only the historical research, but we look at the, the object itself. So we wanted to get as much information about the designer and things like that. So we had an intern doing that research and um, some way she made her way to the family um, to say, you know, if they knew anything about the dress, blah, blah, blah. And, the contact said, oh, you, you, you know, we do have some other things. And um, Jeanette DePriest, who is the widow of James DePriest, who was Marion Anderson's son and, you know, a conductor in his own right. Uh, oh, yes. Supposedly she had, I never know. So I always explain everything. So I'm talking to a lot of people who do know what I'm talking about. Um, I gave her a call, didn't know what she had. And she said, oh, yeah, I have the outfit that she wore at that concert. And I said, oh, we, we'd love to tell her story at the museum. And she goes, oh, I'll give it to you. And, you know, just like that, it was just, you didn't have to explain who you are. You didn't have to explain what you're doing. She understood that. And I flew out and, you know, this is before all the conservatives get to it and you can't put your hands on it and all that kind of thing. And you, history is just right there. Mm -hmm. And, and even the story of the outfit is complicated story. Um, James Dupree's widow, widow is French and she was actually looking for something to wear at the Academy Ball in Philadelphia. And she came across the outfit and she asked Ms. Anderson if she could wear it. And she said, yeah. Um, Mrs. Dupree did not know about the significance of 1939. She didn't know that history. Now, in pulling together the outfit, the fabric was deteriorating. So what Mrs. DePriest did is that she matched the fabric, created a new fabric, but took all the original trim and created that blouse. So it was really a complicated way to describe it. The skirt is original. The turquoise, all that stuff is original. 
The color is original, but it's a different fabric. But, you know, so there is that own story itself. But, um, you know, you know, someone I've admired since I was a child and to have an element of that piece of history and to be able to tell that story with something so important was awe-inspiring. The other thing that I have found most fascinating um, is going through the Hall Johnson collection. Um, you know, so much what we know, unless we personally know someone, is what we hear. You know, we hear about the films and the choirs he directed, and we've all sung arrangements of, that he's done. But there are numerous manuscripts. He writes exhaustively about the role of African-American music, about the spirituals, his own compositions. It's getting to know him, not only as a, the, the choir director, a composer, but to see, and I'm sure all musicians are like this, but you don't really see it, that he was going to concerts and performances. He collected, he engaged in dialogue and to have that all represented there is a get to sense to know the fuller person. And when you get to do that, they are so much more than what we see or what we understand. And there's so much to learn about their lives and what influenced them and what they had to say. And I feel tremendously privileged to get the opportunity to see that. We're still working on unprocessing that, but you know, when the archive is processed, it will be available to researchers who can really do tremendous things with what they can learn there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a couple times about the museum being open. And so I'm just curious how many visitors are allowed in these days? Yes, the museum is open. About six museums are open um, in our phase two right now. We have we started off with only 200 visitors at a time. Now I think we're up to 1,000. Um, it's through tickets only. Um, we're pre pro you know, practicing all safety distancing, safe distancing measures. And, and you know, our, our first priority is to keep visitors and staff safe. The experience is curtailed in some ways because of that. Um, primarily, there are certain spaces that have to be closed off because they don't allow for six feet distancing, mm -hmm. like the neighborhood record store, which is my favorite space and has a Charlie Parker saxophone is closed to the public um, because until you know there's some kind of vaccine, we can't um, pector, um, let people be there. Our interactives, all our interactives are turned off and certain um, media screens, uh, videos are turned off because people, you know, we're creatures of habit. Whenever you see something, we tend to cluster. So um, we're trying to, you know, put as many things in place to maintain safe conditions. And then the Smithsonian is just, you know, keeping an eye on as things change, but that um, it, it, it is still open, even though it's a limited curtailed experience, but still open for people who want to be there and experience the whole thing, which I encourage you all to, because um, we're, we're, we're developing a lot virtual and have great programs, but there's nothing like being in that space. It's a pilgrimage in and of itself. Great. Any other thing that you would like to share with us? I mean, really, it's you gave us such an impressive and exhaustive uh, list. And of course, that was just covering the surface, because as you had said earlier, that you could talk about this subject I for an hour. I could have gone on and on. And, uh, you know, we had talked 30 minutes. And I, when I looked at it, I had 51 slides. I thought, let's see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, um, the greatest thing I want people to understand is that objects are tremendous repositories to help stimulate our imaginations and to remember who we are in our culture. So, you know, you don't have to be a pack rat like me, but think twice about things you throw away. The only reason we're able to tell these stories 
is that people save these things. So when they think about your own collections and what you value or what you want to pass down, um, think about what is important to you and what can tell a story about your own experiences, your family's experiences. Um, and I want to encourage people to do that because it's not only museums collecting, people collect themselves. I mean, you know, this museum movement is, you know, looms large, particularly in music, you know, is it's quite in its infancy when I started as an intern at the Smithsonian a long, long time ago. And, um, you know, whether it comes to the Smithsonian or something you treasure to pass down, um, there's value in it. So um, think of it that way. And you may want to do your own exhibit or something in your own communities. And it has tremendous power, not only talk about music, but talk about so many other things. And that's what's important about music to me, that it touches, it touches on history in everything else that we experience in time. So um, think that way. I, I am actually working on a book um, talking about this, tentatively titled Music and the Meaning of Things, but where I get to go a little deep, where you can look at an object, you know, not only do the social and cultural resource, but actually look at an item, see how it's constructed, what was put into it. Um, as a way of telling its story and a larger story. So I'm really excited about that. And as you can tell, I love sitting and just being with something. But I wanna thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to wax on something I, I dearly love and appreciate it and has meant the world to me and hopefully um, opens doors um, for everyone who comes through the museums and encourages people to think about what they do, the music they practice, compose and play, um, how meaningful it is to us in so many ways. Thank you again for your eloquence and for sharing of your expertise. We want to also thank Lee Kuntz, our executive director of the Gateways Festival for reaching out and being successful in having you do such a wonderful presentation. Um, I hope that all of you who are watching will be able to return. I think it's 7.30, it's 6.30 my time, but 7.30 um, Eastern Standard Time for Anthony McGill's concert. Thank you again, Dr. Reese. And thank you to all well. who were listening. You too. Stay safe. Thanks, Dr. Bye-bye, everyone.